These events took place several years ago, before the Waldorf Astoria began its renovation. The elegant lobby stretched from Park Avenue to Lexington Avenue. In the middle stood a large clock, richly decorated, gilded, with the Statue of Liberty on top. When you're there, I'm sure they'll still be there to watch. The landmark is the perfect place to start your wedding anniversary celebration. Robert Jones, a veteran print news editor for a prominent newspaper, was hurrying down the street through the swirling snow to meet his wife of 25 years, Anne. A successful marketing manager, Anne had, of course, already been there, always on time. They were a strong couple, accomplished, respected, independent, and devoted to each other. Robert was a gracefully aging successful man whose charm and keen intelligence made him invaluable in the main newsroom. Anne has been the driving force behind many of the most successful cosmetics marketing campaigns. Being charming herself and known for not suffering fools, no matter their race, creed, or gender. Robert reached into his pocket. Who knows how many times he did this when he rushed here? Christmas coincided with his 25th wedding anniversary. A long, thin box, a diamond necklace he made for her, 25 stones. His love for her traced in precious stones. He secretly saved money for several years to be able to give this gift. Robert loved beautiful words, so the box bore the ornate inscription, Our love is in diamonds. Why such an extravagant gift? Of course, turning 25 is a milestone in itself, and Christmas has always been special for them. They met at a party on Christmas Eve, and every year they had a date night in honor of this wonderful holiday. The snow made the night seem special, and he felt his excitement growing as he hurried to the woman he loved. The Salvation Army Brass Quartet was standing outside Grand Central Station, and he crossed the street to make a donation. It slowed him down, but he couldn't help it. It was Christmas. Even in the spirit of Christmas, he felt that there were dark times in their life together. It seemed that they were moving away from each other. Anne's career advancement within her company brought increased responsibilities and a new need to travel. Robert led a group of young reporters, full of energy, with little experience and a perfect chance of getting his favorite newspaper sued if he didn't have a steady hand. They began to see each other less often, and Robert feared that he and Anne were starting to get used to it. Anne suggested that they stop focusing so much on the holidays and find something they wanted to do, maybe together, maybe not. He hoped to capture Anne's attention and tear her away from what was absorbing her. Join him in renewing their marriage. Not that he was worried. He knew for sure that Anne would never deceive him. Their relationship had always been strong, and he trusted her. It never occurred to Robert to ask whether Anne was happy with the way things were going between them. Some things should be taken for granted. Isn't that what trust meant? Robert was carrying flowers in his hands. He hummed a Christmas song and walked with a spring in his step. He couldn't wait to wrap Anne in his arms and carry her off to the fairy tale night he had planned for them. At that moment, several men left the bar. Anne was right behind them, standing by the clock and looking around. Of course she was happy. Anne was never late, but Robert always seemed to be late. Anne, hello, my love. One of the men broke away from the group to approach her, hugged her tightly, and kissed Anne tenderly right on the lips. Confused, she responded to his kiss deeply as usual. Mike, honey, what are you doing here? Realizing that her husband could appear at any minute, clearly worried, Anne pulled away. But it was too late. Robert had already seen what happened. He stopped and stepped back to see what would happen next. Anne was still looking around. She was clearly nervous. I'm in town for a quick meeting and then I'm leaving JFK for London on the first flight in the morning. Are you free for love today? Your husband? Without realizing it, Robert slowly moved towards them, listening with growing concern. Who was this man? Who was he to Anne? He could see the wrapped gift in her hands. Was this for him or for this stranger? And their obviously loving kiss in such a public place. Robert Jones he introduced himself. Anne's face froze, her gaze darting from her lover to her husband and back. I see you know my wife, Anne. And your name is... Bill.
Bill Johnson, came the stuttering answer. Bill looked at Anne helplessly. What should he have said? I see that I caught you both at the wrong time. You two need to catch up. There are plenty of rooms available in the hotel if you haven't already booked, and I have to go. Anne, maybe we'll meet later. I'll call a taxi. Robert fumbled in his pocket, trying to get his phone out. Instead, he found himself pulling out a gift box. Anne turned her gift over in her hands, confused, not knowing what to do. Anne, don't worry. I'll find the way. Robert looked down at the shiny, long, flat box with shiny black ribbon. There were tears in his eyes. And, be that as it may, this is for you. He turned away as he thrust the necklace into her hands. There was swearing behind him. They exchanged angry words. He stopped paying attention to it. Robert needed to leave, to leave. How did it come to this? What did he miss by being too busy with work? How could Anne betray him like that? Fucking slut. Robert, Robert. Anne called to him, but he was already at the top of the stairs. Her voice sounded closer and closer, but it was already on its way out. There was a taxi there, and he quickly got into it. Robert gave the address and disappeared. Anne saw the taxi join the traffic. One taxi in a sea of cars it was hopeless to find. What has she done? Robert was never supposed to know. She was so careful. How could she? Who knew she would run into Bill? How could he be so stupid and thoughtless approaching her so openly? Did Bill ruin everything? How could Anne fix this, if at all? Bill broke away from his companions and finally caught up with her. Anne, are you okay? Do you think he guessed? Anne, you saw that he understood everything. Of course, he guessed it. Anne, I'm so sorry. Anne nodded and told Bill that it wasn't his fault, but her whole expression blamed him. What gave him the right to treat her like that, in public, where anyone could see? Couldn't he just say hello and move on? It was a disaster. Robert was destroyed. She will have to change her schedule to make time for her husband. She will talk to Robert and explain why they must overcome this trouble. Anne soon thought of what she would say to bring Robert to his senses. It was a good plan, and Anne saw no reason why it wouldn't work. Robert looked out the taxi window at the lights rushing past. What did he miss? When did she get so far? Was he angry? He felt that this was true, but if so, then why didn't he scream and punch the bastard? Instead, he was alone, running away from the woman he loved, lost in mutual accusations, silent, trying not to cry. Whatever he felt, it was much more than anger. For the first time in his memory, Robert Jones did not know what to do. He felt blinded, abandoned and betrayed. When Anne returned home, Robert was not there. And this was not surprising. Anne changed her clothes, dragged a chair from the living room into the hallway, and settled down, waiting for her husband to return home. She woke up at sunrise and found that he had not come, and she was left alone. It was Saturday. He must have rented a room. He will be home this afternoon. She resisted the urge to call him on his cell phone. He needs time to think things through, she told herself. When he calms down, as he always does, we will talk and work things out. By noon, Anne began to get nervous, and by three o'clock in the afternoon, she was in complete panic. Anne called his cell phone, his office, his gym, two bars she knew he liked, half a dozen of his friends, and his mother, with whom she never got along. Nobody had heard anything about him. By Sunday, she had called the NYPD, the FBI, the state police, and everyone else she could think of. A private detective was hired. Of course she did it all. Her husband was missing and she needed to find him. For some desperate reason, she thought it would help her if she went into town and looked for Robert herself. The crowds of people out shopping made her search a waste of time. When she called her sister Beth for help, her family saw for the first time how dire the circumstances really were. By Sunday lunchtime, Anne's two sisters and their husbands, their children, her parents, her mother's sister Beverly, his mother, some of Robert's oldest friends, and her immediate staff from work were gathered in the dining room, listening to the detective. People get lost all the time, 
The holidays are never a good time for emotional trauma, and Christmas is especially bad. There was no reason to believe that an accident had occurred or that Robert was injured. He suffered a strong emotional shock. This remark drew a few sharp glances in Anne's direction. From everything the detective had heard, Robert was a reasonable guy. They should give him a chance to surface and see what he has to say. Anne flew into a rage, screaming. No, that wasn't all they could do. No, they weren't going to wait and see if Robert's corpse was floating in the river. He should put his other things aside, do his damn job, and find her husband. Don't they understand? Anne wanted to shout at them. She needed her husband. She needed to talk to him, to explain. If something happens to Robert, how will he even understand her actions? How can he forgive her? How could she forgive herself? The detective said all the right things and slipped out the door. In fact, he couldn't do more. It was Anne's mess, and it was her job to clean it up. His departure marked the beginning of the great angry controversy. Those present said they knew the right people who could do something, and then hid behind their mobile phones as if they had suddenly found something important. Anne's brother led the chorus, chastising the police for not doing more. Both mothers sympathized with the misfortune that befell their families. In truth, they were powerless and knew it, and were afraid of what might happen. Her sisters despised her. Anne felt it. Beth announced that Christmas dinner was canceled, and until Robert was found, she would prefer the family give each other some space. As the voices grew louder, Anne fell silent. Her anger was exhausted, and fear tightened her throat. When Beth made her statement, Anne realized that she had no voice in the room. What could she say to the people who cared about her husband more than she did? Anne learned what it was like to be truly alone. Eventually, everyone left. She went up to her bedroom to change clothes. Her dress from Friday evening was still lying on the bed. She picked it up and saw a gift box. What was the last thing Robert said? No, not the last. What did he say when he left? Anyway, this is for you. Anne read the inscription and opened the box. She took the sparkling necklace with a trembling hand. She lost consciousness and fell, still holding the necklace in her hand. It was three days before Christmas, and her husband was still missing. The police have dormitories in the city where they can eat and sleep while working long shifts. Newsboys know where these places are, and they have friends who will let them sleep a few nights when they can't or don't want to go home. Robert had used this many times in the past. It was a 30-minute walk to the office, and Robert was still wearing his clothes from three nights ago. A quick stop at a men's clothing store fixed that. Another quick stop, and he bought a razor and shaving cream. No matter how bad things get, it still has to work. The newspaper will go to print. Deadlines are deadlines. He used his voicemail to listen to calls, had a conference call with colleagues at 9.15 a.m., met with the right people until noon, and spent the afternoon working on a paper discussing sea level rise. The newspaper operated in the same way as all great bureaucracies. If you don't know exactly how to contact the person you need, then there is no easy way to contact him at all. If Anne tried to contact him, she failed. Well, okay, what could I say? For her part, Anne was useless. Her father was ready to tell her to go home, but that would only make the situation worse. Her people were combing hotels, motels, anywhere anyone might be staying, from Boston to Washington. She turned the entire staff of her department into a personal detective agency. If senior management didn't like it, she didn't care. At one point, Anne was heard shouting that they should start looking under bridges, indicating a growing frenzy. Holly, a senior graphic artist, was the one who solved the mystery. Her father served in the New York City Police Department. The police have rest areas, she said. Twenty minutes later, Anne had a list of addresses and phone numbers. Two minutes later, each dorm received a call. When Robert's address was confirmed, Anne was on her way. Robert was already feeling better. The desk sergeant made it clear to him that he could stay until he wanted to leave. The work seemed to be going well. At least it worked. On a beautiful, cold, clear morning, he went for a walk. Anne stood in the path, not fifty feet ahead. Robert, I looked for you everywhere. And you found me. Robert suddenly felt distant, 
as if he were watching him speak from the outside. Shouldn't he be more emotional, he thought. Something was happening inside him. He wasn't sure what it was. He could see Annie in this amazing trick. But no matter how much he was aware of Annie's presence, Robert felt dead inside. It occurred to him that he should be more upset, but he wasn't. Has he lost all his senses? Please, Robert, let me explain. I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't want you to find out the way you did. Of course, Anne. But really, what can I say? That you have affairs with other men, now I know that. I also know that you hid this from me. That you were only caught by accident. I was there. I don't want to hear about the dirty details or stupid stories that it was just sex and it doesn't mean anything to us. What can you really say? Anne sensed Robert slipping away and walked towards him, hoping to physically close their emotional distance. Shall we talk about this publicly? Can't we go somewhere and just talk things through? Anne, I found out about this in the hotel lobby. What could be more public than this? If you have something to say, I suggest you say it now. It stopped her midway. Anne realized that she was not going to lull Robert into a pretense of normalcy and then wear him out. Okay, Robert, let's talk. I love you so much. I've always loved you, but I started to feel uneasy. I didn't know what was wrong, and I didn't know how to tell you, because I didn't understand it myself. When I got promoted and spent so much time traveling, I was with a lot of different men who paid attention to me. Sometimes they flirted with me, and I realized that I liked it. It was the fact that they were new that made their attention different. I was no longer anxious. I was excited to be appreciated as a woman. I needed it, and I couldn't ask you to give it to me. Would you give this permission? We've been together for so long. It wouldn't be fair. Anne, you could tell me all this at any time. That my beautiful wife receives compliments? Do you think I'm such a fool as to be surprised or jealous of this? There was something else, wasn't there? You didn't have sex with me? No need for details, just yes or no. Anne looked down and hesitated. To her credit, she looked her husband in the eye and said yes. And now we have it. I don't know why or how we got here. I can't tell you where I failed you so badly that I lost you. But obviously I did. Robert heard him say goodbye. Did he do it because Anne confirmed his worst fears? Or was it his unconscious decision when he left Anne with her lover at the hotel? He couldn't tell. All he knew was that the words left his lips. It was as if someone had taken control of his mind and body while he was a bystander. Robert realized that he was passing by his wife and going his own way. Anne stood there in shock, trying to comprehend what her husband had just said and done. It was just sex, a little excitement. It didn't matter. She only loved him. She explained everything. Why doesn't he see this? Why didn't he believe her? City blocks in midtown Manhattan are short on streets running north and south, but long on streets running east and west. A native New Yorker, Anne gets lost on her way back to her office. She continued to look for landmarks, something to orient herself, but she was too distracted. She kept coming back to what Robert said. He didn't mean all that, did he? Her legs hurt, she was cold, and her phone kept ringing, so she turned it off. There was a coffee shop there, and she found an empty spot. Why was Robert so angry, so sad? He didn't really say anything. He didn't want details. How many people? Were they better lovers? Are they rich? Were they bigger than him? Better in bed? Isn't that what men want to know? Words to throw in her face. Robert simply did not want to know all the possible reasons for this. The mere fact that Anne hid what she was doing was enough to break him. Had Anne underestimated him? Was Robert really that weak? Why didn't he resist? He had to claim her and fight for her. That's what men do. It hit her later like a sharp pain. No, you fool. You broke your husband's heart because you didn't trust him to listen to you. You never gave him a chance to talk to you about what you wanted. You never told him you were changing. You didn't give him a chance to find ways you both could use to make things work. Why should Robert trust her now when she didn't trust him before? No, Anne. The truth is that you were afraid that Robert would say no. And if he did, you would still cheat on him. You didn't love him enough to tell him and live with the consequences. You made him second after your lover and you. You lied about it. 
You betrayed him for sex, and now you can't live with what you did. The lies we tell ourselves are destructive. The truth, if told too late and for the wrong reasons, can be even worse. Her conversation with Robert was a mistake and another disaster. Anne picked up the phone, but then slowly put it down. Robert was right. She had nothing to say to him or anyone else. She ruined everything. Christmas has come and gone. Beth relented and the family gathered together on Christmas Eve to feast and exchange gifts. Anne was invited, but knew better than to attend. Nobody wanted her there. A few weeks later, Anne was on a long conference call when her father called and told her she needed to take an emergency call. Robert was in the mental hospital for observation. He tried to commit suicide. He hasn't shown up for work for two days. The police were called because Robert was found sitting with a loaded gun and a suicide note. Will she come? His office listed her as an emergency contact. Anne was already on her way, even when her staff gave Robert's room number and the doctor's. By the time she arrived, Anne had regained control of herself and demanded to see her husband and his doctors immediately. The meeting was attended by two physicians, both board certified in psychiatry, one of whom was the author of a respected textbook. Another was the principal investigator of a national study of depression and suicide in middle-aged men. One of them said, Your husband is very sick. He is clinically depressed and has developed a suicide plan and taken steps to obtain a gun. He is a clear danger to himself, if not to others. We are taking him off heavy medication in hopes of giving him a chance to get his act together. Whatever brought him to this state was a shock, but he doesn't tell us what it was. We hoped that you could help us with this. Anne made up a story that probably didn't make sense. The doctors took their careful notes and talked to each other as if it had accomplished anything. This didn't help Robert. She needed to talk to him. I want to see my husband. When can I see my husband? We can, of course, allow you to see your husband, but it must be behind a two-way mirror. We can't risk anything that could make Robert worse off right now. Sadly, this may include meeting you. Was it a bruise on one side of his face? He hasn't shaved for weeks, and his hair. Had they been cut at all since she last saw him? Has he ever washed himself? The hospital gown exposed his bony legs. He looked old, abandoned, homeless, and unkempt. His hands were handcuffed. His head shook from side to side and back. He muttered something with just his lips, a word that she could not hear. What was he doing with his fingers? She moved closer to the glass. The attending physician did not stop her. His fingers, were he pointing at something? On the ceiling? Walls? Did Robert see her? He seemed to sense her presence and screamed louder. Was he shouting her name? Anne thought he was shouting her name. Was Robert pretending to fire the gun with his hand and fingers? Was he aiming it at his head? Was he still trying to kill himself? Anne left without saying a word. For the first time, she realized what she had done and understood what she needed to do. Visiting hours ended at 8 p.m. At 7.30, a family van pulled up with what appeared to be a mother and daughter coming to visit their dad and husband. Security checks were superficial. While the guard was distracted, the mother passed her purse to her daughter through the metal detector. Nobody noticed this. Just before closing, the daughter left, and the mother went upstairs. Psychiatric wards are primarily designed to keep patients inside, not to keep people outside. Anne hung her coat on the coat rack and remained in her crisp white lab coat. Taking the clip file and sample tray, Anne slipped onto the floor and, surprisingly, had no difficulty finding the key to Robert's room at the sleeping nurse's station. How long she sat like that in front of him, Anne did not know. It seemed like hours passed. Gradually, as the effects of the drugs wore off, Robert came to his senses. She must have dozed off, and when she looked again, Robert was conscious and staring at her. Why are you here? You asked me to come, and I am your wife. Robert looked away. Robert, you told me what you wanted. You told me what to do. Out of the corner of his eye, he watched her take a small pistol out of her pocket. I know that you want to die. Because of what I did, you want to die, and me too. We once had a good life together. Let's end it the same way. I'll go first, then you. 
and maybe we'll see you on the other side. Robert looked at his wife. He saw her as the girl he married and all the good things that ever happened to them. She had her plan, but he also had his plan. For Anne, it was as if Robert was looking at her for the first time, and she had never felt more insecure. Give me the gun. Check the hallway. Anne handed him the gun. The corridor was empty. She thought her mind would be racing, but it wasn't. What would it be like to commit suicide? Will she be able to do it? Can she put a gun to her head and pull the trigger? It sounded like a plan, but it really wasn't. She was running away from her own life. Part of Anne hoped that, after death, they would actually be together. If not, then at least she will share the fate of her husband. There was a dignity in their shared choice of how to end it all that Anne could accept. They pass every half hour. Keep your ears open. After the next round, we act. Anne watched. It was her duty. She owed it to her husband to join him. Her throat tightened, but she could do it. Anne had to see this through. It was the only way to fix all the pain and suffering she had caused. She closed her eyes and said a small prayer to whoever could hear her that she and Robert would be together forever. Anne, it's time. Let's do it. Sit on the bed. You first. She hadn't been this close to Robert since that night, and it made her nervous. But it made sense. The gun will fall where Robert can reach it. She took the gun. Anne thought he would be colder. She shouldn't hesitate, Anne thought. Putting the barrel to her temple, she mouthed, I'm sorry to her husband, and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. She pulled the trigger again, and again nothing. Once again. What was wrong? Everything was going wrong. She was going to free Robert and be with him, but the gun didn't work. She looked up, her hands full of her latest failure as a wife, her eyes filled with tears. What a terrible risk. There were so many ways this could go wrong, Robert shuddered. Even as he left that night, Robert knew that Anne would muster all her strength to find him. She would put her entire staff on it, call everyone, hire professionals, and bribe the newspaper staff to report it. She told herself that she was just trying to find her husband, when in reality, she was trying to control him. First find him, and then please him with love and guilt. Gently, she would force him to step back from the ledge and let things go back to where they were. Perhaps Robert could make peace with his wife. But he will never give in to Anne's parade of new lovers, life or death. That's what it came down to. Will his marriage to Anne live on or die? Robert couldn't tell. Robert knew Anne was ready when she showed him the gun. It was easy enough to take it from her and empty it. But none of this drama would matter if Anne didn't play the scene out to the end. Robert didn't think she would do it. She may put a gun to her head, but she will never pull the trigger. To his amazement, Anne pulled the trigger. How could she do this? In awe, Robert looked at his wife and saw her in a completely new way. He smiled and Anne looked at him in confusion. Robert opened his left hand to show the cartridges. His right hand reached out to her, and Anne took his hand and pulled him towards her. She didn't let him go for a very long time. It's time to go home, wife. And they lived happily ever after. Yes, it took some time, very good lawyers, and a lot of convincing to medical professionals before they were allowed to leave. Who was to blame? Does it matter? Who deserved more to be burned? Who cares? Life is short. Love is not enough. When you find true love, dig in and hold on. Never give up. Pray for reinforcements and fight to the end. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Listening to the next one. Listening to the next one. Listening to the next one.